Okay. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, so welcome back to Chennai Java Summit. So since the morning, we have been talking about developing applications, OK? The different ways, and the APIs, technologies, and other things. Ultimately, we are going to develop some applications for clients. They have to use it, OK? These applications, we are going to talk about the process in which we are going to build these applications. So we are going to talk, we are going to discuss rather about adopting extreme programming, OK? And I am not going to detail all the uh, tenets and the principles, OK, uh, what the Agile Manifesto says. But we are going to just touch a couple of topics, test-driven development and uh, continuous integration. OK, so this is going to be the agenda, OK? Agile and XP applications, why XP? Then a couple of ideas about unit, test, unit testing, test-driven development. And we'll see about the continuous integration and the open source projects. OK. I'm Manikandan, based out of Chennai. I'm a consultant and a corporate trainer. I'm involved with uh, building applications for banking, telecom, uh, insurance, and uh, internet-based applications. And primarily, uh, you know, like linking legacy applications with the upcoming applications, you know, like new, uh, new applications. So I have 12 years of experience in application development and deployment, OK. Agile. Agile and XP, OK, Agile methodology, you know, customer is going to be a part of the uh, software building process. He is not an external entity, OK. It's not that you build in software for six months and then show him at the last, OK. He is going to be a part of the team. He is going to collaborate with us, sit beside us, and going to see what's happening in the team. And he is going to provide a continuous feedback in terms of what we are doing, is it correct or not. So in terms of uh, setting the expectations of the customer as well as what the development teams understand, more it works like the, in the IBM way, you, sh you can say it like no, aligning the IT towards the business. So it's not the either way. So the technology doesn't okay, have a say on what the project or what the application should look like. Rather, you help the uh, business the way uh, you understand the technology. Then, okay, code quality. okay. Quality is not an afterthought, says uh, rational unified process. It's not that, no, I'll just write a code, a working code, and then I will change it to a quality code. So it's not like, no, OK, I'll just hit an 100, and then I'll bring in all the shots and other things. OK, Sevag is exciting, but Sevag was, was exciting, but still you talk about Sachin or Dravid because for the quality of they demonstrated in the field. So quality code here is going to stay. So why we need to work on the quality code? OK, as a principle is a code once written is going to be read multiple times. <coughs> you may leave the organization, but the code is not leaving the organization. OK, the team has the ownership. So it's going to really stay on and on. OK, so and it's going to be maintained. OK, in my experience, I have seen at least an application when it's deployed in enterprise. It has to stay on production at least for seven, eight years so that they, ha they get the return on investment. So which means your code once written has to be maintained for at least seven, eight years. And believe me, software assets are never discarded. So which means you know, uh, in the starting, they have written some COBOL code. Then they have started migrating to Oracle or something. Even though after migration, they still have the COBOL code preserved because that is how things work. So something is going wrong in the Oracle, we can go back and check in the COBOL application how things have worked out. So a software asset, it's like your, uh, this one application. Even though you have, we talk about CRUD, the D is never used in an enterprise. There is no delete. You just mark it as an inactive and you keep it. Similarly, software assets are never discarded. They have to be maintained and it is going to have a lifetime along with an organization, okay? then. Accommodate change. Say, you, you'd we talk about enterprise application and other things. Say, for example, we take uh, application duration as you no, know, like building, it takes six months to one year. But what happens to the requirements that, that we are working on in this one year? We work in a very competitive world, and the clients are going to work in a 
very competitive market, which means the by the time we finish the product, the entire requirements might change. So it is not like no, we have freeze the requirements, we are going to start the coding on it, some something comes up, we are not going to say it's going to be a change. Okay. And ID is one of the few professions where you have a uh, privilege to learn about many industries, many domains. Okay. So what happens here, when you understand the domain, when you understand the client, you know that the, there are a lot of variables in the market and you cannot hard code them in the software. The design might not, so today there might be a structure in which, you know, for example, the rate of interest might be different. You say you buy a loan, how many of you have loans? How many of you loans? Okay, rather how many of you don't have any home loan, two-wheeler loan, product loan? Anything, no, everyone has some kind of an EMI going. So what happens, you know, like a fixed loan, a floating rate, they say so many things. You know, when we sign the document, you know, we are not aware. We just look at one figure, you know, what is my uh, rate of interest? But there are so many variables in associated with that. So, so many variables associated in terms of market. So, the, when you just finish the code, okay, they may say that this is not going to be relevant. It is not that no client is actually you know, uh, making you go mad. It is his requirement. If, if our application is not going to serve the purpose, then he is not going to be competitive in the market. So, if he needs to, if he needs to pay us, he needs to stay in business. Which means that there is, should be a change in the way we work with the client. So it's not that no, because he is going to pay us, he is going to go on change something out of his own will. He is acting because the market demands him. Okay, and then delivery and deployment. How many of us okay would have faced a thing? No, like suddenly the client comes, the manager calls, and tomorrow morning I need a demo. And in demo everything breaks down. Okay, everything. In that moment, we don't know which server to hit, okay, whether the database is up, which is, uh, you know, like staging database is up, okay, we try to uh, search for something, it's not coming up. So, are we deployment ready? Are we delivery? So, these are the things it's going to the agile methodology and extreme programming is going to address and you can look into the Wikipedia. So, we are not going to talk about, okay, what is agile methodology and extreme programming, but few tenets or few things of it. And you know this guy, Kent Beck, okay. Kent Beck, sorry, sorry for the mistake. So he is the one who actually you know like one of the key uh, people who is uh, associated with the Agile methodology in the extreme programming, creator of JUnit, the other one being Eric Gama, okay, and Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler, Spring, uh, IOC, dependency injection, okay, he talks about quali code quality a lot. Okay, and this is an agile presentation, which means, okay, you are going to be my customers. I need some feedback from you, so we are going to work collaboratively. Okay, and you are going to be responding to my queries. Okay, applications. This is what we are exactly talking about. Applications have a life cycle, so you develop, deploy, maintain, and no discard. Okay, so in each phase, the requirements uh, in terms of you know the teams and who is going to interact, all this is going to change. Written once, read many times. Okay, how many of you have has cursed us, uh, cursed the previous developer who has written? Okay, program. The primary uh, question is: We write code, but is it for humans or compiler? Is it for humans or compiler? Compiler. Then we could write it for us. We could write it in assembly language. We could write it in machine level language. The source code that we write is not for compilers, it is for humans. Okay. It should be highly readable, highly maintainable. Which means, it does not mean that no, if, I, if I can write three lines to solve a 8 queens problem, to demonstrate my expertise in a C++ or a C or Java, it might as an individual be good, but it is not fitting into an organization. Many of us can single handedly run a project in an MNC kind of an environment. But again, look at the risk involved. Okay, so that is why exactly who owns the code, team owns the code. Okay, who owns the code, organization owns the project. Okay, even we have uh, IP, intellectual property rights, all these things. So whatever is in the public domain only, we can claim. With respect to business, we have IP with respect to the client only. Even we do not, we assign the NDAs and other things. 
So, understanding okay, these things and quality code is readable code. So, it does not mean you know, okay, I can write the same 3 lines instead of I can write it as 10 lines, 15 lines, but make it much more readable and the guy who is going to maintain it for next 7 years okay, is going to be pretty much happy and is going to worship you. This guy saved my day. Okay. Or if you do the other way, make it perfectly intelligible, no, like unreadable for him, he is going to curse you. Okay. Even after 6 months you look at your own code, there might be a fairly good enough chance that okay, you might end up spending a lot of time for a simple things. At last, if, if you look at the business logic, it is nothing but if then else. If we are not able to write it in a very understandable way, okay, that is where the core things. Whatever may be the technology, you know, talk about web sockets, uh, whatever, Jack's RS or SOAP, whatever may be, finally the business logic is going to be a simple if then else only. So, you are going to look at the data and process, it is going to be a simple conditional decision only. Okay. Why XP? You have to look at the other, why not XP? Okay. Extreme programming, when you look at, there is a lot of trends, you know, like pair programming, you have to start uh, working as a pair and then you know, the productivity is much higher okay, in terms of uh, they say unit test. Okay. But the key benefits what I am going to talk about is customer is in kept in light about the process and program. So, he knows readily what is going on. You know, we give them a plan, we have a scrum meeting and because he is a part and parcel of the team, he is not, you know, he is not kept guessing what is happening. After 6 months, will, will, will my product be delivered on time? Okay, these kinds of things are not there and then team owns the code. I think during code retreat, I think you no, know, we did the, for every iteration we do it, we delete the code. So, okay, we have a lot of attachment towards the code that we write. So, someone says no, this way of uh, doing things is wrong, we get very egoistic about it. Okay. So, ultimately we get paid for what we write, so do not better know, do not attach any sentiments towards it. So, who owns the code? The team owns the code, the organization is the, so the same thing can be done in multiple ways. So, in the morning we somehow like the same for each loop, streams, using lambdas, combinations. I can go to Mumbai by via train, bus, even by walk, okay. possible but not feasible. So, it depends on the scenario. It depends on the scenario, okay. For world peace, I might go, okay. That times it becomes you know, that becomes a constraint, so I need to walk, okay. So we are not looking at you no know, like uh, which is the correct way, but which is going to fit into the scenario. Today it works. Will it work after six months? After one year? This is the question. So today for this kind of a project, we work with this technology, we work with this configuration, but is it going to hold good tomorrow? That is the question. So, that is going to be the perspective which we need to work with. So, there is no individual ownership, sentiment or egoistic approach in terms of who owns the code. Organization owns the code, which means the team owns the code. So, something going bad, you should be ready to discard that. Okay. And quality code. Quality is not an afterthought, which means, okay, again we have standard practices and other things to ensure. So, do not look in terms of QC, quality control is something you know, after you finish it, the product you test it. Quality assurance is something, while the process is happening, you have to make sure that is going to, the end result is going to be good. So, concentrate more in terms of QA, okay, there are a lot of tools is going to help you in achieving that. You know? There is a common way of writing code, you look at the standards, you look at the conventions and other things. Working code, okay. So, there is a lot of uh, emphasis in terms of documentation, documenting the code and other things. But one tenet says, no, we should be accommodative about the change. When things are meant to change, okay, if I keep on no, like putting a lot of efforts in terms of documentation, okay, the amount of, already we know like, no, we say no, like only 20 percent of the project time is given for coding, okay, lot of guys, you know, many of the developers want to jump into, you know, straight into, start coding things which means you no, know, like you see something and you jump in, okay, without even seeing whether there is a water in swimming pool, that is very deadly scenario, okay. So, we have to do analysis, design all these things and come back, 
yes if we do start concentrating heavily on the documentation part if tomorrow something changes whatever effort we have put in is going to be yes then what is a good level of documentation when you start working with good apis you know the packages naming conventions the class convention you no know, like method one class one responsibility one method one task okay and then strictly follow the decompose you know, like uh, your own design in terms of you no know, architecture you use the abstractions and the interfaces to the max okay keep the code scalable and then you you write comments and java doc this is more than enough for a this one so the qa process if you follow correctly you don't need to put in a lot of time in terms of explaining or documenting the current code so the core the code will be self explanatory you know i don't need to put in a lot of things on a, as a open file is going to be you no know, like much more i don't need to write a lot of things you just say open resource okay and then and where there is ambiguity there needs to be more detailing in terms of what it is going to be when it's going to be more precise okay the standard convention standards and conventions are enough to give them a very good idea of what's happening okay and just a java doc will be enough then working code okay again xp talks about no like you don't invest more time into you no know, like uh, analysis design or something more you just start writing code okay it's not just start about writing code again we we start from the user stories okay you you start from user stories definitely you have to do a use cases okay then don't jump into not try, try to do all uml diagrams and then start with basically you need to you know just start with the use cases uh, so that it corresponds to user stories okay and then understanding you know whether uh, whether it has been you no know, done correctly that again a reverse presentation or whatever in terms of understanding the client requirements domain and all those things so nowadays we don't get stuck with uh, you no know, like this uh, products and frameworks a lot you know how things have evolved okay now we go into more of a open standards base you just write as a pojo okay and max annotate with or even if you work with spring you know you know that it, spring is base, uh, less invasive you just write it as a core java more and more what happens is we start using things you know writing things as a core java only your hibernate uh, uh, spring struts whatever may be the frameworks if you compare with the earlier uh, generation uh, this one earlier versions you you need to implement some interface extend some abstract classes but now it is less invasive so technology with which framework i am going to work is not going to be important rather than no, translating the business requirements as a core java if i can do it i can deploy it, i can work with anything so i don't need to get with stuck uh, get stuck with in terms of uh, frameworks and other things also most things in java is specification based which means if i develop for tomcat it's going to work on jboss okay if i am going to do it uh, uh, with uh, for example jdbc api say excellent example of specifications and uh, implementations jdbc api is nothing but a specification which is nothing but an interface but the drivers are nothing but the implementations so code to interfaces spring talks about code to interfaces so which is a very good practice which was advocated even no long time back no 1995 1992 when people talk about all this eric gama these people were talking about the best coding practices and other things code to interfaces which means you can vary your implementations i don't my code is going to be you know completely loosely coupled i will not say equal to new hello world okay i can rather go for any implementation okay iterative development so i don't i break things into a lengthy for example a six months project i break into five milestones every five week is going to be a milestone every three day to seven day max minimum three days to max seven days is going to be and my iteration and each iteration i have a measurable output and each i at the end of each iteration i'm going to keep my customer involved so he sees things in case he is not happy with something is in case he is expecting a, a swing and you give him a tire you know that no that the graphic pitch pick which circulates around all he ask for is a swing and you give him a tire you say both swings okay he is as if no you walk into a hotel and you ask for idli and he give you dosa and the server explains both is made of same floor only dosa maav and idli maav same only 
we are not going to accept what we ask for we should get it okay so he is going to put into perspective that boss what you have built is not up to my expectations okay so we have a chance to rectify things then and there you don't need to wait for one month for the client to come back and not tell him. after six months you are not going to do the uat he is going to be there seeing now what is going to be done what is happening and uh, what, uh, whatever is uh, uh, data is or process is given we are testing it then and there so he is going to be pretty happy with what's happening and with client asset we also have a great responsibility of no like making him happy so he being away we have a you know good gala time okay fifth month we'll start concentrating on not giving but he being aside or he being a part of a team we are going to ensure that he gets a output every 3 year at the end of every iteration it may be you no know, like as small as 3 but we don't uh, recommend no xp again you don't need to follow all the practices okay it's according to our organization say for example we talk about 6 months project what happens to a, for example a small enhancement or a small module which is going to be you no know, built in 15 days okay so something might be applicable something might not be applicable depends on so you have generally a process which is going to be for your team customized for your team for your organization you need to decide okay i'm going to take this try this in this project if it's not going to work okay i will fall back to my last process okay so again delivery or deployment ready so the process of building the software it's going to dictate you no know, for example tomorrow evening someone calls up sensational like the client uh, vp or ceo is going to come in he just wants to see a, a preview of uh, the project then we don't start integrating that time okay we don't start integrating at, at that time so that's where your continuous integration is going to help you it's going to on a daily basis you are going to test okay each time whenever you build it it's going to automatically i can say for example uh, every one hour you build it or whenever the code is changing at the repository you pull that and build it so what happens i know for example individually at my workspace things will compile for example i ran run a j unit test suite it's going to run compile fine but what about no is it going to work with uh, my offshore team whatever code they have developed individually it may build but when it comes to no integration it might fail okay so those things are needs to be those things needs to be addressed and xp is going to help you that unit testing okay so the primary objective of unit testing is every method that you write should be testable okay every method that you write should be testable which means you no know, if you have already written a you know, done a project and if you are trying to write j unit some methods might not be testable so which means the next time when you start doing it each method should be testable which means a method should do only one task okay method should do only one task so if, for example if i am doing a step of activities okay open a file write something to it and close okay i might not dump everything into a single method and try to do it okay should be every every method should be okay uh, should deal with only one task or something okay and i should write the method so that it's going to for example no like instead of putting a void simple i can write a boolean something or return some information so that i can test it few chances are that for example i may try to a file system or something or a db so we might need to write a separate test to find out what whether it's working or not okay but make sure you are going to write a method which is going to be testable and unit test cases for all sunny day and rainy day scenarios okay let us take this scenario okay so i am going to uh, go to a atm and withdraw some amount okay what are the possible uh, scenarios that i can encounter money debited and the cash may not come okay yes so which means okay the cash is not uh, coming then there may be a problem with atm yes service no unavailable IRCTC classic thing no it's down <laughs> okay then atm card stuck pin yes exactly atm card stuck then pin incorrect it cannot dispose more than 40 notes at a given time okay you see something happening 20000 got uh, debited from your account and it's saying no cannot dispense cash more than 40 notes okay 
and 2, 3 seconds later you get a message, the amount is credited back. Now that time you get your life back. Okay, <laughs> it happened to me once. Okay, so again, what are the other scenarios? ATM might be out of cash. Okay, all these things. If you look at all this scenario, we generally call the sunny day scenario as a working scenario. That is a normal flow. Okay, and rainy day scenarios are nothing but the alternate flows. If you understand the use cases, these alternate flows are nothing but your ex exceptions in your uh, business logic. Okay, pin incorrect exception, card stuck exception, or whatever. No, no unable to dispense note. Uh, then insufficient balance exception. So, when you look at the use cases, why I asked you to do at least use cases is, use cases you generally look at a scenario that is a normal execution, okay, that is the sunny day scenario which is going to work. The rainy day scenarios are alternate flows which are nothing but the exceptions. So, the uh, scenarios in the use cases are nothing but the exceptions in your applications. So, exceptions, it is not an error handling mechanism with respect to Java, it is going, it is actually a flow mechanism. It's actually a flow mechanism. Okay, it's like your uh, uh, if then else. It's like your uh, for looping. It's a flow mechanism. It controls the flow. I, within the try, you say try. Uh, this is the normal scenario. Try this scenario. If it is not working, you are going to come to the catch the alternate scenarios. Okay. Then unit test for all bugs. It for example. Okay. Uh, <coughs> you identify a bug in the business logic. So what happens? You write a J unit test to find out whether that bug is resurfacing again. So this might come a lot of times. So for example, in version 1.1, we would have fixed a bug, but in the subsequent release, someone might have changed the code. Okay, how to avoid resurfacing bugs? You write a J unit test for that and see that that bug is not there or it's fixed. So that's why we say whenever you uh, add on to the code. Okay, whenever people add on to the code, you should write and run the test first. Okay. This is normally when you write the J unit, but what is the significance of test driven development? Okay, which means here you need to okay, just write the test first, okay. Yes, before writing the code, which means you no, know, maybe the class and the method name, it is okay, fine. Okay, you might end up writing the just the class, so it is just nothing but a skeleton. Okay, but you will not have any logic inside it, just you got a skeleton or whatever, stub or whatever you call it. Okay, so first we write a test for it, we write all the tests. So, what will be the starting point uh, here is nothing but take an Excel. Okay, you think of what are all the possible scenarios, like in the ATM kind of a scenario, you write all the scenarios. Okay. And for that scenario, to simulate that scenario, what will be the input and what is the expected output? This is serves as a template for you to write the J unit test cases. So, first write the test cases, you run the test cases. Now, all test cases will fail. So, the test driven development says, okay, you write the logic now one by one. So, initially all the tests will fail. Now, you have to make the test one by test one by one test pass. So, you do not write all the logic and run it. You first write a logic, run it. So, what happens for example, for this withdrawal, okay, for a single activity, you may end up writing you no know, like 10 test cases, okay, 10 test cases. But what it makes is, it makes, it puts a clarity in your mind that what you are going to write, okay, what are the possible scenarios and the moment you say test driven development, you know what are the possible inputs and outcomes. So, which means when you sit to code, you do not have any challenges. All your challenges are okay, now solved. So, you know this if this scenario is coming, this is going to be my output. So, there are no surprises when you write the code and you, you know now how the exactly the, your code should function. Okay, and this will be in line within your business uh, requirements or functional requirements. So, write the production code run the test, run the test. Finally, for example, no, I write the all the test cases for that, I write the logic first and then I fill all the methods with the logic and finally, I, I run it multiple times, maybe 10, 15 times to achieve completely. Now, you know this code is works. For example, okay, you release this code to uh, repository, okay, 
SEM or say for example, subversion. One of your uh, okay, peers is actually working on the same thing, he, add, he is adding some logic to it okay? and he, now he runs it. In case he has done, he has uh, given uh, or he has actually raised a bug for example, now the one of the test is going to fail which will clearly indicate that okay, whatever change he has made has affected the code. So, he understand what is the change impact. Okay. So, immediately he fixes the bug okay, and he can give. So, not only for us for to work with the rest of the project and rest of the teams also it gives a lot of clarity. So, it does not mean no, no, for example that is why we said the team owns the code. So, anybody is free to make a change, but is that change is going to be in line with the business requirements or the expected behavior that the J unit is going to ensure. Okay. Okay. Begin with the end in mind. So, you know exactly what it is expected out of that component. Okay. Be ready with the test cases. Yes, we discussed about the ATM example. You just write the test cases in Excel and with TDD more clarity on uh, data input process, output and exception. Even for example, what is the exception that needs to be? So, when I say okay, pin is incorrect, I should get a pin incorrect exception. So, you give a wrong pin and just check whether that exception has come out or not. Okay. So, this we are talking about the individual workspace and other things. Okay. When I okay publish to a subversion or those kind of a thing, okay, when I publish that, so how it's going to know? Like for example, the tester is going to take it and build it. Somebody is going to do it, but why not? It should be automated, okay? If it's automated, say for example, your process is going to pull all the uh, this one, no, uh, <coughs> code from the repository and going to run all the J unit test cases. Okay, and then give a report. For example, even it can check for the code quality. Exactly. It saves, no? For example, even if you get a guy uh, for a lag to do this job, he will, he cannot do it. This is something you automate whatever it's repetitive. Okay. So the same thing, no? Some we are we'll be happy to type couple of lines in Excel, but I give you one lakh records and ask you to type in Excel. Okay then you are going to know this, I am going to quit this job. Okay. So, if this is not, we are using computer, we are not using a typewriter. So, better write a code to know pull this. So, whatever is repetitive, we are, we are trying to make it uh, no, automated. So, this is again going to be an automated thing, which is going to pull an information, okay, do it. But continuous integration, the principles are the same, what we do, what we follow. It is going to maintain a repository. Say for example, in SVN, automate the build, put in an AND script or Maven or Gradle, okay. self uh, testing okay, code, J unit testing G. Okay. So, everyone, no, he is not going to keep the others in the team guessing. So, at least check in, check out, no, you are checking your code at least a day okay. and everyone has to write J unit so that, see you are writing a code, you should be responsible enough to check whether it is working or not. Now, now, you can have an ego here. I am not going to release a code unless it is going to have a J unit. According to XP, a code is considered to be working only when it is going to have a J unit test for all scenarios addressed. Okay. So, everyone can see the results of the latest build, that is very important, not just the manager. So, everyone in the team, you say team is the owner, everyone should be able to see what is the status of the build. Okay. Then, automate the deployment. Yes, I can do, no, like. For example, all major projects, JBoss, Tomcat, okay, people do not know deploy it by hand. Automated, no, like everything passes, then move it to a repository. Maybe, you know, some people where they can download it, or for example, I can uh, put an uh, artifact or uh, this one, no, like archiva or which one? Yeah, night levels, all these things. So, it can keep people involved, knowing that, no, what is this, uh, what is the thing? <coughs> And if it is successful, I can push it to a repository from there where people can you know, like download and start using it. So, not like a beta or alpha or whatever may be. Yes. So, the developers, okay, they check in, check out from the SVN, from SVN uh, Jenkins with, for example, we are talking about code quality, okay. Sonar, Curvatura or uh, Java code coverage tool, okay. 
this is going to give you complete and I, again I can automate the deployment to JBoss and other things also. When, when the process is defined, you do not need people to intervene. I do not need a release manager to check everything. Now, what he can check? Even he has some limitations. He cannot do what the J unit uh, or uh, test ng is going to do. Maybe he no, hit few things and check, just check. Okay. So, if, if the complete things is process driven, I do not need a guy to sit 247 to look at what is happening. And a lot of communication is going to be, you know, like, come down. Huh? The people are not going to ring up you or uh, email you and ask or ping in a IM and ask whether this is done, what is the status. Hello, boss, look into the URL. Okay. So, yes, develop, build, test, deploy. Okay. You have a version control, build automation, code quality analysis, and artifact management. You are done. Okay. And this is uh, Gen uh, this one, uh, this one is actually JBoss with Hudson. This is the build page. Even we can see it actually directly. Okay. They give you, you know, for example, if something goes bad, you get it with the different icons. Things are going to be okay. This is what the sunny day, rainy day scenarios, which I am talking about. If things are okay, you no, know, like anyone can see it. So, follow the open source projects, okay, for a lot of things. How to build? What are the best practices? What is the uh, code quality? How the process is done? Okay. People are sitting round, okay, in different physical locations at different time zones to deliver a quality software like any open source, you no know, Tomcat or JBoss. Okay. For example, so the same process we can actually uh, you know, adopt in our organization and do it also. It is not an excuse you now saying that uh, if we start uh, concentrating on code quality or process, I will miss my deadlines. No, it is a myth. The only thing is to get used to it, you have to put in at least you know, like a week or so to understand how it works, what are the advantages. It is, basically, it is asking you to change the way you write the code. And that this is where we are not no accommod we are not accommodative. We are not accepting change. Okay. So if it's going to be my own project, I'm going to use it, I can write it the way I want. But if it's going to be used, okay, for example, a banking or a telecom, okay, or an Android app or anything can actually affect lives of millions of people. The code you write can impact lives of many people, directly or indirectly. Okay, so that responsibility has to be there in terms of I am going to write the code as per the standards prescribed, as per the conventions given, as per my organization and team's expectation. This is going to be the key in moving forward in writing a quality code. So there are no excuses in saying that no, the process, if we follow the process, it's going to okay, delay the timeline, deadlines, all these things. It's just excuses for not adopting a certain practices. If, if it is going to be process oriented, you do not need to be there in a holiday sitting and just giving, you know, like putting in extra time and asking people to you know, like only if I am there the entire project moves. That kind of a scenario is not going to be there. More it is going to be process driven, okay, less dependency on the people. If it is going to be people driven, which means there is no process. Process driven, okay. The other thing is the process is going to only dictate how well your product is going to be. Again, the CMM, whatever, ISO, it talks about process. Anything that is certified as ISO, it is not a good quality. It says it is a consistent quality. CMM also does not say that it is a good product. Okay. The product has followed certain norms, standards and process. So, they are actually certifying the process, not the product. Okay. And we get all the CMM, ISO in paper and we do not follow it in spirit. Okay. Even if when you move on to the other organizations, they are going to question about what is the process you followed in the earlier organization. That is going to be the key. So, any questions? Am I done? Yes? Okay. Thank you. You need to stop right, so it. We're going to do some quick demos. Yeah. yeah.